Good evening, everybody. Woo, yeah, that's hot. Um, great, great to see you here. Thank you, everybody, for coming to what I'm expecting to be a fun and interesting night. I'm going to say a few outpost-type words, and then... <laughs> can't tell the difference, can you? <laughs> I learned it all from Andy. Anyway, uh, the... Uh, So um, these are some of the people I first met when I came to Albuquerque, and it's great to be doing a uh, doing a program around it. We we're great we're grateful to be able to reschedule it after uh, uh, the, the snowstorm in Santa Fe that made it be canceled uh, back earlier in the spring. I want to thank um, everybody for uh, for. Uh, abiding by our what we're doing to try and keep things safe here and wearing masks and so forth. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. And we have new air air purifiers over there. That R2D2 is over there and I'm not sure who that one is in the corner. And our air our ceiling fans and so forth. And trying to keep things going and it's been great. Want to thank uh, all the people who have all of you. Many of you are members kept things going through the hardest times when we were shut down and it helped you know it really kept us strong through that and we have many funders I want to thank the city of Albuquerque mayor Tim Keller the arts and culture department under the direction of Shell Sanchez the Albuquerque City Council the National Endowment for the Arts Doris Duke Charitable Foundation the Command Foundation the McCune Charitable Foundation and many more I want to thank the New Mexico legislature and Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham for it allowed us to uh, buy new sound equipment and also install video equipment so we can do some streaming, which we've done. Tonight's show is not going to be streamed, but it is going to be recorded because I think it's really an important, uh, important discussion and fun discussion to have. So uh, we, we, it will be uh, available. Um, we have a few shows coming up that uh, we have many shows coming up actually. Tomorrow night, Dave Grusin and Lee Rittenauer are up at the Lenzik. They've sold out again. They have the honor of having sold two sh sold out two shows at the Lenzik in less than two months because we had to cancel one. That was sold out. Then some tickets were available, and then they sold out another. So that's something they can put on that Dave can put on his resume as he, you know, when he when he turns 90 and does a new resume, you know, in several years he can uh, put that on the resume. I sold out the Lenzik twice in two months. Um, any rate, we have this exhibit up, which is a benefit for Ukraine, and you can buy these prints, and some of the proceeds, most of the proceeds will go to uh, a cause in Ukraine. You have Jim Gale's beautiful photographs in the back hall. Um, so on Friday, we have the concert at the Lenzik. On Saturday, we're showing a film here that was made by Barbara Bentry and John Rangel about Dave Goosen called Not Enough Time. And that is what it's about, because it's just amazing what he's done. And there will be a discussion afterwards. Dave Goosen will be here, and Lee Rittenauer will be here. And the show has been cut since we showed it. You know, I mean, it's been uh, shortened, edited, finalized. It's going around to festivals since we showed it in 2018. Then we have our great jazz festival is coming up in September this year. Terry Lynn Carrington, Robbie Coltrane, Count Basie, Carmen Bradford, uh, Doug Lawrence with Carmen Bradford, Joel Ross, Samara Joy, Pete, Peter Erskine, Alan Pasco, Derek Olds, Tower of Power, Kurt Rosenwinkel, and more, uh, Eric Fluimans, and come on, Catherine, help me out. Eric Fluimans and Will Holzhauser, duo. Catherine is uh, sponsoring that concert. We thank all of the people who sponsored. And she's doing that in honor of Tom Singleton, her husband, who passed. I uh, want to want to welcome everybody from the, who's part of the Jazz Workshop over the years. I think Maya Mace is here, maybe, or, or is coming. All right. Thank you, Maya, for coming. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, uh, I'm going to turn, turn the mic over to... Uh, 
Charles Lowry, who is so important in the jazz workshop for so many years. There were so many people who were important, and Charles will talk a little bit about that, and then we'll get into it. On the screen there is, is uh, Jack Luffler, who couldn't come down from northern New Mexico, but he's here via Zoom, so we're re really reaching amazing pinnacles of technical wizardry, which is thanks to Andres Martinez and Reinhard Lorenz. So Charles, if you would, do the honors and please come up and share the stage with me. The last time we actually did this together, I think was at the uh, Mingus, uh, the Mingus Big Band. Uh, yeah, it was the Mingus Big Band at, uh, at the Highland Theater. And uh, we, I had to do something like this, what I'm going to do now. So please welcome my friend, Charles Lowry. That's okay. Was I better back then? Yeah, we, we all were. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. All right, all right. How's everybody doing this evening? Good, good. Well, I have to tell you, it's truly an honor for me to be here to um, uh, be in the company of these outstanding individuals that uh, helped create and develop something really special in New Mexico, in our community, the New Mexico Jazz Workshop. Uh, I'm so fortunate uh, to be a part of that as I had been since I started in uh, 1990 as a jazz workshop board member. Didn't know anything about running, volunteering, or any of that to do with the jazz workshop or virtually any other nonprofit, but I was fortunate to learn quickly. I learned much about the nonprofit world of music, the nuances of fundraising, marketing, education, programming, working with artist management, concert production, print program design, from all the people that are around me, too many to mention. But a few who helped me succeed very early in my career and my journey were people like Jim Williams, George Sampson, Alicia Alton, Carolyn Kinsman, Perry Wilkes, Clara Kilcup, Denise Aguilar, Sarah Hutchinson, graphic artist Greg Tucker and Michael Martley, Jim Moore and his staff at the Albuquerque Museum, Chris Nichols, a host of board members, volunteers, sound and light technicians, stage crews, sponsors, members, advertisers, and members of the community. And best of all, all those wonderful jazz, blues, and salsa musicians that really helped launch uh, a, a new era of the jazz workshop. And I was so proud to be part of that. <clears throat> also, a very special thanks to Tom Gorelman. I was fortunate to part with, partner with him in uh, presenting concerts early in my tenure. I learned so much from him then, and I'm still learning from him today. So it is my pleasure to introduce these fine gentlemen who are going to be part of this panel discussion. Gentlemen, please come on the stage. As a trombonist turned anthropologist and, f and <clears throat> excuse me, and film filmmaker, Steen Feld was involved with the inception of the New Mexico Jazz Workshop from 1974 and its early years in Madrid and in New Mexico schools. Drummer Pete Amal, a 2020 inductee into the New Mexico Music Hall of Fame, has been one of the New Mexico's most represented musicians ever since he got off Natalie Cole's tour bus on Highway 14 near Cerritos, New Mexico in 1970, where he's lived ever since. Like Steve Feld, he was one of the founding members of the New Mexico Jazz Workshop in 1974. He widely admired Jack Leffler, who describes himself as a former jazz musician who began playing in the 1950s. Hold on. Performing on trumpet with small groups and became involved with the New Mexico Jazz Workshop from the mid-1970s through the 1980s. And, according to him, his greatest jazz influence was Clifford Brown. Founding member and bass player Dave Moyer was part of the group of musicians for the 1976 Madrid Ballpark season, going on to play with his fellow jazz workshop musicians and bands and school tours and tours throughout New Mexico in 1979. Until 1979, excuse me. Experimental saxophonist Tom Goralnik moved to New Mexico from Boston in 1976 and immediately got involved in the New Mexico Jazz Workshop, taking over this direction and moving it from Santa Fe 
to Albuquerque in 1979, therefore, thereby becoming immersed in the nonprofit jazz presenting world. And he ran the New Mexico, Mexico Jazz Workshop until 1981. Yep. And although unable to join us this evening, we want to send a shout out to Michael Motley. He moved to Cerritos in the early 1970s and became involved in the Jazz Workshop as a friend and graphic designer since its inception. So ladies and gentlemen, our panelists for tonight's discussion. Thanks so much, guys, for being here. Um, it's really, you were the first people I met when I came here. Steve, you were away at that time, but I met you a year later, and uh, you know, and, and it, was, it was great to hear music out here and, and to become a part of it early on. I actually do have a little cheat sheet that I forgot I had, so I do have some questions uh, that we can jump off. And we have this uh, PowerPoint that we can uh, look at some of the things to j jog memories, but the, these guys have so many stories and go back so far with, in friendship and in music. And, um, and the workshop was really a, a, a unique organization as a, a, group of, um, a group of musicians who got together, a collective of musicians who played together, organized concerts together, wrote grants, it, you know, right at the beginning of the grant writing process, did all these things in the school and schools and uh, were really a, a central part of, of the scene of what was happening here. And uh, it's an honor to be here with them. Um, so I, I wanna start with the, a question of, uh, you know, there were many people, S Steve, Dave, Pete, uh, Sherman Rubin, uh, Jack Luffler, and, and others who have passed, Jay Peck, Peter Deckert, Tom Mack, um, uh, and, and so forth. And I'm, I'm curious, like, what brought you guys out here, and uh, how did you get going? And, and, uh, and then I wanna let them riff as much as possible, so if I, because they have so many wonderful stories, it's great to listen to them. But anyway, let's start with that, like how you got out here and, and found each other. Who wants to start? <laughs> Why don't you start, Steve? Can I start? Yeah, okay. Go for it. Let's see. I jumped on a jumped on a bus, went out to Denver with a group. The group broke up. I heard about a patron of the arts in Santa Fe, who owned the Ramada Inn. I met him, set up a, a you know a, a meeting with him, and. I said, I'll bring a band out. You got six other hotels. <laughs> Give me room and board, 80 bucks a week for each member, and I'll hang for a while and go play your clubs. And that's how I started off in uh, Santa Fe. Liked it so much, I did 18 months, came back, and decided to uh, settle in Santa Fe and raise a family. That's my story. That's how I got started. That's the beginning. <laughs> Steve? I first came here in um, 1972 to Santa Fe. Um, I was a graduate student in anthropology, and uh, the National Science Foundation uh, was sponsoring a summer institute in film and anthropology at the Anthropology Film Center in Santa Fe, which was a very unique institution. Uh, and, uh, and then I came back uh, the following year and spent another semester uh, in film school there. And, uh, but it wasn't until I was pretty much finished with graduate school that I really began to meet musicians and people in the world around music. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I met Pete uh, the night the Bourbon and Blues Club closed, and that was in the um, that was in 1975. I heard about this. Uh, I had just finished graduate school, and it, it came out to uh, Santa Fe to live to wait until I got a grant to go somewhere else, and um, <coughs> for research. And uh, I heard about this club that was legendary but was closing down, and so I thought I'd go out and, and hear what was happening. And um, 
I don't know, out of chutzpah or whatever, I took my instrument with me. <laughs> and, um, and Pete was playing with Sherman and Jay Peck, and who else was in that band, Pete? Uh, let's see, that would, actually at that time, it was, uh, it was uh, Jim Ates. Jim Ates, the bass player. It was yeah. Jim Ates, yeah. Jim had a local group here with Stephanie uh, Sieber. Mm. Yeah. Stephanie Sieber? No, yeah. uh, I can't recall her last name. I don't think that's her last name. Okay. And, uh, but anyway, and Pat Rhodes was on piano. And right. And uh, Jim was the bassist, and we met. And I was interested in mental health because in 1970, uh, I got a job working at a mental health clinic in Massachusetts. Jim was the assistant director of mental health in New Mexico, and that was our connection until we played together. Yeah. <laughs> and that became the main connection. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, that was the, the core group originally. Yeah. So I, I think for me, um, the first discussions and idea that, the first idea or inkling that I had that there could be some kind of scene here and it could it could develop in interesting ways and because of people like Jim and many others uh, and then we a little Jack will tell his story but um, meeting Jack um, began to realize that the community of people who are interested in jazz were also interested in a lot of other things and engaged in a lot of other things and that's, I think, really probably that was the origin of the educational kind of uh, discussion about the workshop being an institution that not just supporting musicians for gigs and things like that, but, you know, like getting involved with jazz education in New Mexico. And um, uh, at least I, that's the earliest, some of the early conversations I remember with Pete and with Jack and with uh, Jay Peck and Sherman and, and Dave, and, I, and lead, leading to, you know, an actual desire to, like, do all those gigs in the, you know, like, play all the elementary schools in the state, and, you know, just really start um, doing that uh, kind yeah, of your thing, first that kind of outreach. The yeah. first grant to the New Mexico Arts Division yeah. was a grant, I think it was a thousand dollar grant, yeah. <laughs> and you toured every school in the state. But at <laughs> any rate, <laughs> things were different back then. Uh, well, actually, they weren't different at all. They're exactly the same. But at <laughs> any rate, uh, but I remember, you know, reading that and actually going to the arts division meeting where it was discussed and so forth, you know. And Steve, it just makes me think that you have a history of shutting down clubs, it seems, and hopefully. Yeah, yeah. So everybody enjoy your night here, because it could be, <laughs> could be last, because I think our quartet, uh, when <laughs> Steve and I had a quartet la much later on, you know, and, and we shut down Don Pancho's theater when it became the Atomic Theater, yeah, so right. we were the last gig there. So so at any rate, uh, be, be warned here, everybody. We shut down the wet spot in Philadelphia, And the too. wet spot in Philadelphia, <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, so, we're, you know, we're, we have a history. Yeah. <laughs> so, Dave, Dave, give us well, your stick. I came out here in 1973 um, to visit some people, and I haven't left yet. Um, I'm still here. Uh, but one of my first jobs in New Mexico was I was the night auditor at the La Fonda Hotel in Santa Fe. And at that time, there was a long time uh, band leader named Antonio Mendoza, who some of you might remember, um, quite a character and quite a musician. And he used to just say, bring your bass down and come up and play with us. And, and I did that a number of times. And um, the first time I did it, when I was done, he handed me, a, I think, two $20 bills. And I was like, really? OK. <laughs> Um, but one of the people I met, he came in quite often, um, was Sherman Rubin, and I got, I got to talking to him and got to know him, and he'd come up and talk to me at the front desk at La Fonda, and at, one po at a certain point he asked, um, you know, we're trying to get this organization going to play music and to promote jazz, and 
we need a bass player. Um, so I said, sure. And uh, I think Sherman was, he, he was kind of, he was someone who, he, he was maybe the, the best network person in, in, in that bunch of people. He knew a lot, he knew a lot of people and, and was very gregarious. And, and he brought me, he, he's the one who initially brought me in. And, uh, mm -hmm. and then I met these guys and, and that was it. Yeah, Sherman uh, was from Boston, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was actually a cousin of mine, we found out somewhere down right. the line. And then also he had the honor of being some, my father was an oral surgeon and Sherman locked himself in the closet when my father <laughs> tried to work on him. And they, my father remembered it, you know, <laughs> it was memorable. <laughs> but anyway. Sherman, get out here. And he uh, passed away this past summer, right? Right, or he in, did, in yeah. August, yeah. Yeah, he did. He lived out his life. He asked me to go to Thailand with him, and I did. And uh, I went out there three times. And he made his life there. But in, at the beginning of all of this, uh, when I did that first uh, stint with the uh, his name, gentleman was Ted Richter, who owned the Lamarta Inn. So I came back and, and, and uh, I sent for Andrew Kastner, a really fine bass, uh, guitar player rather, who's the band, he, he leads a, an establishment called uh, Jack Mack in the Heart Attack. And he's made a, a, an incredible, wonderful life for him as a songwriter, guitar player, and band leader. But, and I sent for Sherman because the two of us were together in a band in Boston before I came here. So that's how Sherman came here. And, uh, and uh, I called up uh, the owner of the Bourbon and Blues, Mike Allison, and I said, the band's breaking up, I'm coming back, but I need to go a separate way, and would you help this guy? And, and uh, Mike hired him as a short order cook. <laughs> Anyway, and then Mike had this idea about starting the New Mexico Jazz Workshop. And Sherman told me about it, and I was totally for it, man, because uh, we, had, we had different perspectives on it. Mike had a, Mike had a, um, a liquor license, and he wanted to put that to work for him and have a facility in town. And, but me, uh, coming from where I came from, uh, I, I grew up 20 miles, 29 miles to be exact, from Newport, Rhode Island. And on a $2.50 ticket, I saw the greatest players in the world. And so my mind was just, Steve put it well in one of the conversations we had earlier. And it, it was grassroots. I said, no, no, the ballpark. Bring the kids, bring the family, bring your dogs, bring a picnic basket, and, and we'll have a $2 ticket. <laughs> anyway, so that was the basic idea. That was the Madrid, the Madrid ballpark. The Madrid ballpark. And Jack. then these guys all came, Sherman introduced, uh, well, I met Steve, he's right, the last day of the Bearman and Blues, and then, uh, uh, Chairman introduced me to you, Dave, and yeah. we put together a core group from that point on because Jim Ates left the state, yeah. the bassist, and he, he was into, like I say, mental health, and he moved to Alabama, and he's still there uh, working at some mental health clinic, you know. And, uh, but anyway, um, so the core group formed with Chairman and Dave Moyer, and then and uh, Sherman, and we all met Steve, and then he brought in Mr. Jack Leffler, who, I <laughs> who I, I, you know. Well, Jack, I, met, Jack met us in a very unique kind of way, and uh, we'll let Jack tell that story, but it's really quite, it's really yeah. quite a sweet one. Yeah, Jack, jo uh, thank you for joining us on the big screen, and, uh, and uh, tell us where you are also now at this moment. And this this poster that I have up, I don't know if you can see it, Jack, but uh, 
This yeah. is Michael Motley's first uh, uh, graphic arts work, I believe. And that, so, but anyway, for the and we, all, we all looked like that, too. <laughs> I think we did, yeah. <laughs> Hey, it says admissions 150. I didn't realize it was that cheap. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jack, tell us, talk to us. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you. I'm currently sitting in my studio looking at the sunset, and uh, I've been watching some lightning hit pretty darn close. So, if I suddenly disappear, you'll know what happened. <laughs> anyway, uh, I can't. Here comes some rain, too. By golly. Um, hey. Hey. <laughs> happened, man. Uh, I was hitchhiking across the United States back in 1957 or 58, and I passed through New Mexico, and I knew I was going to have to be here sooner or later. And it took me four more years after I got out of the Army I was a jazz musician in the army, believe it or not. <laughs> and uh, we also played things like marches and stuff, but we had a lot of jazz. And uh, at any rate, I came to New Mexico on October the 3rd, 1962, and have thus remained. And uh, I had my horn with me. It was kind of tricky back in 1962 because there really weren't many jazz players around. And also I was taking strange gigs like being a fire lookout on top of a mesa looking for fires three months out of, out of a year for three different years. And uh, I play my horn, but I had a little group uh, up there. One of the players was a coyote and the other one was a turkey. And so we sit there and play music together, and that was it for me until, <laughs> until later down the road. And then back in, well, I guess it was 73 or 4, maybe, uh, the New Mexico core group, which in my recollection included you three guys plus Jay Peck and Sherman Rubin, and that was it. Um, yeah, and you guys had a gig at the Capitol Rotunda. And uh, Steve and I both had Nagra tape recorders, which in those days were the state of the art for recording. And I th one of you asked me if I'd come and record. Well, ro <laughs> recording in the Capitol Rotunda is really challenging because the, the acoustics suck. <laughs> it's simple. <laughs> But anyway, I got really Unless turned you're off. you're a solo flutist, then it would be good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what I did, I got into it, and uh, I was invited to play. And so I joined that group, and uh, boy, we had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun. I know that much. I, one thing that sticks out in my mind that I want to mention to Pete, back in those days, We've been playing a lot at Madrid for years, really. But one time, Pete's folks came to visit him, and he brought them over to our house to introduce us. And I want to say, Pete, I have never been so honored. That was really one of the cool memories, man. <laughs> Thank you, man. I'm honored to hear that and from you, you know. Because uh, it's mutual. You know, wow. things were pretty loose in those days. And, you know, I don't know how we got that gig playing in the Capitol Rotunda. Uh, it was just a few tunes before they threw us out. But, uh, uh, you know. You didn't close that one down. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Jack was there. And Jack was our most enthusiastic listener, you know, and, you know, struggling to try and get a nice recording of that day. And. I remember it was that that was the first time that I that after the recording Jack, Jack said you know I play trumpet I really like this kind of music you know uh, and we and everyone said yeah, well come on man join the band <laughs> I mean it was really it was really a very loose um, kind of thing and I think uh, 
you know, what I remember most about the spirit of that moment with Pete and Jack and Dave and Jay and Sherman was, um, you know, nobody was really thinking that Santa Fe was going to become a jazz capital or that we were going to somehow turn Santa Fe into this incredible jazz town or, you know, we weren't thinking about presenting people or, or doing stuff. I mean, some people came through who we knew from our various trails in life as players and, you know, that sparked some kinds of things happening. But I think everybody was thinking about this kind of new sort of space between um, like the, the world of professional music and the world of you know people who just love jazz and who want an opportunity to get together around the music. And I think the ballpark in, you, and what Pete said you know about about the Madrid ballpark uh, that really that really came out of that and uh, you know, those 10 weeks uh, in the summer of 1976, uh, you know, with a core group of players and, you know, really filling the bandstand each week uh, with people who'd bring their picnic baskets and, you know, <laughs> their, like Pete said, their, their dogs and their Frisbees. And, you know, I think it, it, it kind of was like a hippie jazz party, you know. Yeah, but so. one thing was a biggie to me was that all of us wanted to see if we could get jazz out of nightclubs and outside and into the open air too, because that was a big factor, I thought. Right. Yeah. Right. So I have a question. Um, I think we should. Who is this mythical J. Peck character you keep yeah. talking about? Yeah. Because uh, he can't. Yeah. Do it. He's not here anymore. Yeah. yeah. He's the man that told me that Muta Paducah said, it's not too good to live in a white man's will too long. And I understood him. <laughs> <laughs> Jay was the first person of our, our group who actually, he, I think he came in to the LaFonda front desk the night after I talked to Sherman about joining and came up and introduced himself. And, um, uh, the w one thing I remember a lot about, well, I remember many things about Jay, but um, he was he was actually approached by both Coca-Cola and Budweiser early on in in the Madrid shows to be they offered him you know that their name as uh, sponsors for the and he he turned both of them down he didn't even didn't even consider it. That was not part of his agenda or our agenda was commercializing this or you know yeah. turning it into some kind of corporate yeah. um, thing and there were a lot, he had a lot of integrity that way yeah. and he 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 actually took he handled yeah. the books for yeah. the first mm -hmm. four or five yeah, years he was the treasurer yeah the original treasurer and wow. he, you know he, Jay he actually, he, yeah Jay yeah. the other the other piece of that is that, you know, I really bonded with Jay because both of us had, you know, awful history with nightclubs. Both of us really hated music in nightclubs or what nightclubs were doing to music and musicians. I think both of us uh, would have probably gone on to be professional musicians and working um, in the, that world if we had not had such awful experiences when we were young, trying to break into that and do it for the first time. And so, you know, Jay really had this, you know, he was working as a lead chef at the Pink Adobe restaurant in Santa Fe. He learned to cook uh, in the army. He had many skills. And, um, and he just, you know, I, I met him in that jam session that, uh, that night that the Bourbon and Blues closed. And he just had an extraordinary spirit, you know. The spirit was about the music and about the fun and about the people. And it was not about the clubs and, you know, the workshop idea was, you know, for musicians to do things for musicians and the community. But Jay was really the, Jay was really strong on, you know, like, I don't want to be part of this unless it's a community. And I, I think Dave's story really speaks to that. That was a big 
I, I had done 11 years. I went out, I was 17 years old, and came off the road at 28, dropped out, and came here at 30 years old. So that was a big thing with me. With me, at that point, I was, all I want to do is like play. I just wanted to play, raise a family and play. I, li I literally was thinking, I mean, I looked for work in the mental health thing. I, I got offered work at Los Lunas in Las Vegas, but I didn't want to be the, the big guy on the floor. You know, that wasn't, I was dealing with uh, what they call uh, sheltered workshops. And that's what the work I was do doing. But anyway, that, that was the premise. Uh, you got, I'm, I'm really glad to hear you guys talking about this because that was the thing, man. I just wanted to play. I'm looking at this picture, and you can see it. You can, I mean, this, if that isn't grassroots, what is? <laughs> you know what I mean? Because, uh, yeah, and it was really wonderful time. Ray Dink, I see behind the music stand there. He, yeah. You know, I did two weeks with him in Red Rod. Red Norville, uh, Harry Hamilton, uh, uh, you saw him earlier behind the vibes, the young black man. Uh, we were doing a gig at Casablanca and Charlie Mingus came in and, uh, and he asked to sit in and he sat in and at the end of the gig he walked over to Harry Hamilton and really liked him. I don't know if you know the story but this is true because I was there. And, and Mingus asked him, you know, for a contact and if he would consider going to New York. And Harry couldn't read. And Harry, Harry just blew it off. He, he didn't know what to say and just said, no, I, I, you know? Huh. So, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but anyway. Yeah. I think the other thing that was really important is that, you know, like that story of Harry not reading, you know, we were all very varied in our levels of skill, and we were all very varied in the kinds of jazz that we liked or most wanted to play. And, uh, you know, we all, you know, it wasn't like let's have a bebop band or let's have, you know, like let's do swing tunes or, you know, and like, you know, like Peter Deckert, who was elder, you know, he was an older guy and retired at that point. You know, he was a, you know, like he grew up as a, you know, really <laughs> serious swing clarinetist, you know, and, you know, like the kind of kid who grew up hearing Benny Goodman and it changed his life and stuff like that. And, he, you know, Peter was much older than all of us, but he had this super youthful spirit, you know, and he, he would come in and, you know, he, he would sit in on anything. <laughs> and and then he would bring these charts for the rest of us. And so I think everybody was, you know, really uh, kind of liberated from the fact that we were not a working band and we didn't have to rehearse and play a specific repertoire, uh, repertoire, you know, in a particular club. And we didn't have to all master the same thing. We could just come into it with whatever skill level we had and everybody was just kind of supportive of each other. and you know, it happened. And there were some people who passed through whose skill level was extraordinary and remains extraordinary, you know. I mean, Pete was the, ex you know, an incredible inspiration to all of us because, you know, he, you know, we all felt like a million bucks playing with Pete on the drums because he, he made us all play better and, you know, improved our sense of time and you know, our sense Don't of give me something I have to live up to. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, you know. All right, we'll <laughs> stop right there. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, Pete, you were, you were really had the most professional experience of all of us. And, you know, and you also had your, you know, strong feelings about what the industry of jazz both in, in the world of recording and the world of concertizing and nightclubs and stuff like that, and the life on the road, what it, what it was about. There were no illusions about some great life on the road as a jazz musician. After you listened to Pete's stories, you were really happy you were in Santa Fe in your little hippie apartment. But they were, <laughs> but they're great. <laughs> they are great stories. Yeah, try playing the Chitlin Circuit in 1962 <laughs> with a black wife. 
<laughs> wow. Uh, that's right. Oh, excuse me, 1963. <laughs> so I have a specific question. Why, why the name, the New Mexico, why the jazz workshop? Ooh, well, the, I, the first conversation I remember having around that was sitting and listening with Sherman to the Jazz Workshop record, you know, with Charles Mingus, oh, yeah, and yeah. hearing about this, you know, the, the kind of way that Charles Mingus and Max Roach really bucked against the grain of the record companies and the clubs and the whole ownership and stuff like that. And, you know, they were really the first musicians who were really, really, really well known and extraordinarily accomplished in, in the world of jazz, who were saying, you know, musicians should be doing this with and for musicians. We should have our own publishing companies. We should have our own record companies. We should have our own ways of, you know, this is really before the days that like jazz was taught in universities. So the only way to learn jazz was to apprentice with somebody who, you know, knew much more than you, right. you know, or, you know, and I remember as when I was a kid in Philadelphia, you know, I was just lucky because of the proximity of neighborhoods that we had access to, ex you know, extremely talented and extremely skilled black musicians who would take on white kids, you know, who just loved this music and, you know, try and teach us something. Uh, and so this kind of idea that um, uh, of the jazz workshop I think we were both politically and, you know, in other ways, you know, kind of inspired by uh, the, the Mingus Jazz Workshop recording uh, project and uh, both the idea that you could invent a new kind of music and you could invent it outside of the strictures of what the record companies wanted you to do. And, you know, there was something defiant and resistant, but also really community oriented in the, in the core of that and with a real concern about passing on the music. And, and I, I wanna say this again, this is before it was possible for people to pass on this music by going to conservatory. You know, jazz musician, the first jazz musician to get a job in a really serious music school was 1971. Um, and the, you know, the first black musicians to get serious positions and be recognized as masters of this who had, you know, who could, who could actually teach it to people, you know, that was in that period, 71 to 75. Yeah, and, and, uh, and, and they were very political also. And they I were mean, very political, I mean, right, the, exactly. Some of them were the most avant-garde musicians yeah. at that point in time. Cecil I Taylor, Jackie McLean, Bill you Dixon, know, at, Bill at Dixon, Bennington, where yeah. I studied, and they yeah. went out to Madison. Cecil T Taylor Cecil went Taylor, out to right. Madison, and yeah. so it yeah. was a, it was a, at that point, it was not mainstream at all. So I mean, I think that was something that inspired us, and something that was part of our conversations. We didn't think we were going to be great avant-garde musicians, or you know, start a record company, or you know, d d but we were definitely inspired. By that, and I think Mingus as a figure, well, I think all of us had probably read Beneath the Underdog and loved the kind of mythos that surrounded Mingus um, as this, you know, as this guy who could be unbelievably sweet and unbelievably fierce, and you know, and you didn't know which one he was going to be when you looked at him, and you know, the stories <laughs> surrounding him were extraordinary, and um, but he you know, was really the first person to say, you know, I hate the word jazz. Jazz means inward music. And, you know, he made that statement, he made it in the press, he made it over and over again. And that was the moment of the birth of the jazz workshop. And so I think we took that name because we were really just, um, you know, really inspired by that. You know, of course, uh, Santa Fe was very different back then. Yeah. I remember. Oh, it was incredibly different. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a, a totally different scene. There was a guy named Max Finstein who had been a jazz alto player on the West Coast, uh, a really fine poet, a beatnik poet, and uh, but all of his teeth fell out, and so he couldn't play the alto anymore. But... Uh, 
he still had the beat, man. He was great. And, uh, but there really weren't many people who even dug jazz at all back in those days. I, I had actually before, I, I was briefly in Indianapolis and I wanted to mention, Steve, that there was that dynamite bass trombone player, Dave Baker, who was actually teaching down at Indiana. And uh, there, was, there was this group of black musicians in Indianapolis that was really far out. And they'd let me play with them, which was great. And uh, boy, did I learn a lot from those guys. But the upshot is, is that the black community was really separated from everybody else at that moment in time. And I realized that from my perspective, jazz is a means of bringing people together rather than separating them because a lot of those guys were like that. Mm -hmm. They wanted to get it out there and they mm -hmm. wanted to bring people together. Absolutely. And it was to me one of the that was a really fine period for me. That was back in the early 60s. Yeah. You and, know, uh, uh, Dave Baker, um, the story of Dave Baker that you mentioned, you know, it should be extended. I mean, because he was really the premier jazz pedagogue of the first wave. And um, it was, uh, I went to graduate school at Indiana University. I started there in 1971. Dave was one of the first people I met. And, um, um, and, and he married a classmate of mine and, um, and you know, he, he, he was just a really uh, extraordinarily uh, open person. But uh, as a musician, Dave was extraordinarily gifted and got a scholarship to Indiana University where he studied with one of the great classical trombonists in the history of this country, Tom Beversdorf. And Thomas Beversdorf just thought Dave was a phenomenon of the trombone and never had a student who learned so fast and so much and took the world of technique uh, on the trombone so far, and which is all the more tragic that you know Dave had a car accident and could no longer play the trombone, and, but he became a fantastic bass and cello player. Yeah, and jazz. And, uh, but anyway, Tom Beversdorf was the person who insisted that Indiana University hire Dave Baker. He said, you know, you'll never get as good a jazz trombonist. And beside that, you know, this university needs to start, you know, cultivating and bringing uh, black students into the music school. Because Indiana was a very segregated, Southern Indiana was a very segregated place, even in the early 70s. You know. So, Boy. you know, that story of, you know, I'm really happy you mentioned uh, Dave, Jack, uh, because, you know, uh, there was a spirit, I think, with, you know, like Tom, with your experience with Bill Dixon, you know, that first generation of people who were teaching, and, you know, they, they were really extraordinary pioneers in changing the, you know, what jazz could be. And I know that I was certainly when we started the conversations about the jazz workshop and all of that, I, I was very inspired by Dave Baker, his example um, during the fi the four years that I studied with him at Indiana um, were really, really profound. That's great to hear, man. It really, because there were a JJ Johnson who was from there too. Uh, yeah. And uh, from Indianapolis, JJ was from Indianapolis. Yeah. Yeah. He was from Indianapolis and, uh, uh, Slide Hampton, another trombone player, was from there. And uh, this was back in the days just before the Black Panther movement was coming on. And I really got to see a lot of foment mm -hmm. in that particular arena, too. But boy, jazz wise, Indiana, Indianapolis was a very happening place. I, I enjoyed that. But getting back to the New Mexico Jazz Workshop, it just seems to me that among other things, to me, it was just an awful lot of fun that we had. Yeah. Just a tremendous amount of fun. Yes. And it looked forward to it every week, man, yeah. being out at the Madrid ballpark. And I think, you know, we had so much fun because we really weren't 
worried about being great professional musicians. Yeah. We were worried, I mean, what we were all <laughs> into was having a good time with each other and that's meeting right. other yeah. musicians and, you know, and you I think that's, that's when the jazz workshop was incorporated, that's really, you know, the kind of background. It was just the camaraderie of a small and then a larger and larger group of people. Yeah, it really, and it really did grow larger and not just, uh, not just in Santa Fe. Yeah. And not just at Madrid, you mm -hmm. know. So, I mean, there were a lot of, uh, there was almost like a, I mean, in, in a sense, it was an Albuquerque chapter when I moved here. Mm -hmm. And there were certainly people who were deeply involved from Albuquerque who were playing out at the ballpark. And then I remember they were playing at the J, at the VFW out on Central mm -hmm. in, in the, uh, during the winter. And you guys were doing the uh, community theater yeah. space. Right. right. And then also the Rio Grande Flyway, when you started the big band. Yeah. This is a a, a, yeah. a picture of that group with, with, uh, but uh, yeah, I just Sherman's in there uh, and uh, Dave and Jack, J, Jay up on and top. Jay, um, and me, the kids. Tom what about the kids? The Sanchez. And Chief and the Sanchez, Sanchez brothers. is over on the left. Yeah, yeah. Um, he looks like he's about yeah. twelve. Yeah, he was. I mean, but boy, he was a good player. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mark Clark was in there. Also. Yeah, he's, he yeah. wasn't in this. Well, Pete was drumming in this. Pete was yeah. drumming in this, yeah. but Mark came along in. later and drummed yeah. with us sometimes. Yeah. yeah, and it was led but by what, what, flute player named Shelby, Shelby Bojo there. Yeah, he's Shelby up in the top yeah. left corner. One of the two on the bottom here is Steve Marsh. Oh, who, yeah, Steve Marsh. Who, yeah. He went on to lead Lyle Lovett's big band. Right. Um, and he's from Los Alamos. I recall but that. I, when I was, when and I he was studied with Arlen. I think he studied was in this picture. I couldn't figure yeah. out if it was him or him. So, Doug Lawrence came out and, and uh, sat in in Madrid at the ballpark. Yeah. He was 17 years old when I met him. And in terms of, you know, there were people here who were mentoring students in jazz. I mean, you know, Arlen Asher's story yeah. here, of course, is unique and extraordinary. But um, Bob Farley, the trumpet player who had a music store, he was also, you know, very, he sponsored concerts for yeah. us and he was very yeah. generous and, you know, Nick one Lucchetti. I mean, Nick Lucchetti also. Bob Brown. And, you know, yeah. so. You know, once things got going, um, we found all this friendship in like an older world of people who yeah. were part so of the music profession in different ways. Yeah, like John Lewis, who was in one of those pictures back yeah. there. But I was thinking, you know, the Albuquerque musicians like Harry Hamilton, John Lewis, Professor Harry Robinson, Robinson. we need to talk about that. We need to talk Bo a little you bit guys. about yeah. <laughs> how long I want to bring up have? Do you have like three hours or something? <laughs> there was something I wanted to bring up while yeah. we have that picture up. Uh, Tommy Mack, That's who yeah. uh, he was a trombone player, but he was also a producer, a record producer, and he had a whole bunch of arrangements. I think a lot of them were Count Basie arrangements, and he just made those arrangements available, and that's how the whole Rio Grande Flyway big band started. Same nasty code. Yeah. yeah so, Tom had the whole Sam Nestico book yeah. uh, from the Basie band yeah. and a bunch of other things. He was a record producer at ABC Paramount and was very successful. And before that, he was a trombonist and he played with Glenn Miller. It was, you know, he, he, his story was really interesting. And he sort of retired to Santa Fe and even though he didn't live that long, the couple of years that he was with us, you know, as an older mentor and friend and somebody who was just like super positive and encouraging and saying, you know, but, you know, all of these, all of this, you know, energy that went into this was not about, you know, like putting together some ass kicking band and going out on the road. If it you was, look at it. It was, it was you yeah. know, it was about staying here and having fun in the community. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Jared. You wanted to say something? I didn't want to no. interrupt you. If you look at the whole thing, we're talking about families going to a park, having a picnic, listening to music, and then the, the people are local players who have the opportunity on a Sunday afternoon to go and sit in and play with, play with a, a, a core rhythm section. So if you, if you just look at that, that's the whole. 
that's the whole, that's what it was all about. It really, I had other thoughts about it. Uh, I think when Tom took over, you know, he, uh, it became a lot more of what I thought, what, what I thought, and that was that I wanted to see in my life, in my life, the outdoor concert exposed me to this music and great players. So, of course, we didn't have that. But, but Tom was the first to, yeah, to say, you know, I could, Tom was the first to start to bring it here. Right. I mean, you know, when you brought Sam Rivers and Dave Holland and, you know, that whole oh, Art Fe you know, all those people in the first sure. wave of, you know, that, that you brought out, Tom, you know, that, I think that was the, the, the most major transformation in the, in the right. first 10 years. And then years. we, of course, started playing. This is, believe it or not, Steve and myself at Madrid. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, yeah, that takes I mean, a lot of people, gumption people for me to show that picture to you. Yeah, pe people even picnic listening to us, you know, playing our crazy stuff. But um, I just let let let's just touch a little bit, and then I do want to uh, talk a little bit about when I took it over and yeah. and how that happened, and um, and uh, and I want to show some of these beautiful. Uh, posters that Greg Tucker made at that time. Um, but at any rate, I, w another thing that was happening in New Mexico at this time was the Mirror Lounge in Albuquerque. And you guys were all involved there also. And um, there was a <laughs> bass player from Washington, D.C., right? Wasn't, wasn't yeah. yeah, he was. Harry yeah. Robinson, yeah. you know, um, and he uh, sort of was the house band. He and Sherman and you, Pete. Right. Yeah. The house the rhythm house section. That was yeah. a house band. Yeah. And Harry, well, tell us a little bit. I mean, this what a Harry. it was such a great club. Yeah. It was yeah. Such a great club. But the, the owned mirror by lounge Bobby was not Foster. A Bobby Foster and his and his sister, right? Yeah. Right. They owned it. He was the only person who knocked down Muhammad Ali, I believe, right. uh, up until the end. And uh, Bobby Foster Road is, is, he then became a parole officer or, a, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. But yeah. at any rate, the Mirror Lounge was, it had the best jukebox anywhere. Well, the I, Mirror Lounge I, was actually, you know, uh, a kind of, it was a perfect liminal space because it was actually uh, the Knights of Pythias uh, house. It was not a, it was a private uh, club. authorized, you know, nightclub. So under the banner of a private kind of club, uh, which also served as a kind of community space and a place where, you know, a lot of black people in Alp, I mean, it was, I never saw more black people in one space in <laughs> New Mexico, right. you know, at that time than, you know, I would see when I'd go to the Mirror Lounge. I mean, cause the community, you know, really enjoyed hanging out at that place. And Bobby and his fix, his sister were like real fixtures yeah. in the in the in the community. Yeah, and Bobby sense. was just, you know, he had uh, Professor Harry, who was not just really a, a wonderful character and bass player and singer and raconteur, but you know, had both the kind of bass baritone voice and the kind of style where you know he could just channel Billy Eckstein all night wonderful. long. You know, and, yeah. and it, it was angel a, eyes. A, yeah. You know, yeah. and it was really, really a, a wonderful when uh, I, experience. When I met Harry, when I met Harry, we we were talking, and I, you know, we talked about where I was from, and and him being from Washington. And I looked at him. I said, Harry, were you with Fat Man Wilson in 1960? at the Narragansett Lounge in Fall River, Massachusetts. <laughs> and he said yes. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Harry was a character. Joe Murphy, the owner of the Midway, he was a boxing trainer. And that was the, he was Bobby Forster's trainer. Yeah. And uh, I had a wonderful experience that, that Tom mentioned just a moment ago where the, uh, uh, Muhammad Ali walked in with an entourage and Bobby Foster and and uh, and we all sat at the same table and had a wonderful afternoon of talk, you know, and because 
he was an icon in my life and many others. And uh, we played with, uh, let's see, Joe's, Joe's sister got up there and sang, and, and Harry played bass. John Lewis was there. Yeah. And John I think Lewis that's played. where a lot of us met Dick Trask. Yeah. Because um, I remember, you know, I went to sit in at the mirror one night, and, and you know, just luckily Dick did too. And, you know, that was wonderful. I mean, he was really just a, you know, extraordinarily upbeat, positive, encouraging character. And, you know, because he was, uh, I mean, he was a very, very fine musician, but he also had a life outside of music. And, I, you know, it's interesting that we just had so many people here in New Mexico, um, you know, not just, you know, you know, really excellent musicians, but people whose life, you know, connects music with other kinds of things, uh, whether it's in the world of business or in the world of medicine or in the world of, you know, research or, and I, I think that's also very much part of the uh, way in which this became a community. And, uh, you know, I remember when we, s when we signed the original papers for the jazz workshop, um, and we did that through the, uh, with the help of a Santa Fe lawyer uh, who named Peter Schoenfeld. And Pete was a bass player. He was also a vi volunteer fireman. He was like, you know, I mean, I, I remember gigs with Pete where he would leave in the middle of the gig to go do a fire thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the only bass player who, you know, like had a siren on the top of his car. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, he was a lawyer, and he, to this day, he's very active as a lawyer in water rights in New Mexico. That's his, been his specialty for all these years. And, um, you know, he helped us, you know, he incorporated us, you know, as, as a nonprofit. And, you know, the, uh, in those days, I don't know if the scrutiny was heavier or, you know, it wasn't that people were starting nonprofits, you know, here, there, and everywhere. Yeah, I mean, well, the was, way yeah. it became very popular. So, um, and we just had a very simple statement of principles, and Pete, you know, just said, just make it really clear that this is not a commercial enterprise, and that, you know, what, what it means to you guys to be a nonprofit is that you're here to promote jazz in the state of New Mexico. And do educational And activity. do educational outreach and get jazz into the schools and get jazz into the community, promote more jazz on the radio, you know, stuff like I'd that. I'd like to interject something there about the, uh, the jazz in the schools. We had a really strong ally in Mike Jenkinson, who was an administrator for New Mexico Arts in those days, it was known as the New Mexico Arts Commission, and Bernie Lopez was the director, and Mike was an administrator, and he really got off on jazz, and he really had us do a bunch of grants right. that funded right. us to play and, all and, over the place. Yeah, in the and school. That's, that's, that's where the school thing really took off, when Jack connected us with Barry and Mike. Yeah, that's, you know. And you toured all over New Mexico, and you had poets with you also, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, John Brandy was one of those poets. Mm -hmm. I remember. And Joy Harjo <laughs> also was? Mm -hmm. yeah, well, one, I played a gig with, or I, I played drums and something else. I can't remember what now. Uh, bongos. And it was Joy Harjo and John Brandy. Yeah. And it was in Santa Fe. And... Uh, then shortly thereafter, John Brandy had, he was an artist in the schools down in Socorro, mm -hmm. New Mexico. And he asked the workshop to do a jazz poetry gig with him down there. And so we did, it was a, an interesting experiment. And then I remember you and I, Steve, doing another one with John Brandy. I don't know who else was playing, but I remember he was reading his poem, Turning 30. <laughs> And he's now in his late 70s, and so that's how long ago that was. <laughs> yeah. So I want to jump forward. Uh, yeah, Diane DePrima, we also did some gigs with Diane DePrima, 
during her time here, and that was really extraordinary. She was a wonderful poet amazing and, and, and amazing person. And, um, you know, just really up for the whole, you know, any kind of experimental jam. And, uh, you know, that was, uh, I mean, we were hippies. <laughs> so yes. very briefly, and I want to, like, also make the point that the jazz workshop is still here. Now, that's the amazing thing, you know? The, uh, um, you know, Maya is the new director here, and, and there you know, have been so many people who've run the organization, so many great people who've run the organization over the years, and uh, it continues, and it's vital, and I forgot to mention the concert we're doing together, uh, which I, I would be in trouble if I didn't mention it, it'd be stupid of me, but in a week, we're presenting Pedrito Martinez together at the museum, and they started, uh, you know, the, the jazz workshop, and when Charles was involved, started the series at the museum, museum, Music Under the Stars, and before the amphitheater was built, and of course, Women's Voices that Patty Littlefield curated the uh, last week mm -hmm. just happened, and Salsa Under the Stars happening with Son Como Son, so the, and all the classes that the workshop does, so it continues on 45 years later or something. 46 years later. And uh, yeah, so right on. I remember for me, there was a point where you guys, for whatever reason, Steve, everybody was kind of going in different, this is the way I remember it, you know, so now's your chance to correct me. But the way I remember it is at a certain point, you know, everybody was kind of going in different directions. And uh, I think uh, Jay said to me, Oh, you know, we have a thousand dollars in the bank. Just do something with it. Bring your friends out here, and and that's how I got involved. You know, not that's not how I got involved because I was playing with you guys, mm -hmm. of course, also. But I thought, okay, well, you know, present a few concerts, and I presented my friend Baird Hersey and David Moss. I thought, well, just bring some friends out, and then I thought, well, okay, okay, this is kind of cool. So the first concert we did, uh, we wrote a grant for. A series, a new mu what we called new music series, um, and uh, I enlisted the help of Greg Tucker, who's here tonight, who mm -hmm. still does graphics work for the artwork for the Jazz Workshop, has all these years beautiful musicians' portraits and stuff. But anyway, Greg, Greg and I uh, were good friends and actually did music and visual arts things together. And Greg started designing. Uh, posters and um, so the first so I wrote a little grant and we did you know it was going to be two seri two concerts and Anthony Braxton was the first one and then Sam Rivers and Dave Holland was going to be the second one I believe and and Greg worked for a sign company at that time what was the what was it was the big sign company what was it Greg that the name of the company where you worked sign painting company <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, you did, and you had access to, like, the way these posters were being made. This was, of course, b before computers, and the way these posters were being made was by projecting them on large services, and then he would make the large posters that would fit into the, the uh, window of the chemo. But at any rate, that was my idea, was to do that. And I remember Jay, Jay uh, the first year, and I said, well, let's do Madrid again. And it really was, like, we started to charge more money, and it was like a lot of people, a lot yeah. of money. Mm -hmm. And I remember Jay, um, you know, with his gun in his pocket and the thousand dollars, thousand dollars, walking around the ballpark together, and he's like, kind of like my bodyguard. That was the first <laughs> year, you know. And uh, <laughs> was that seventy-eight or seventy-nine? Uh, when must was that? seventy-eight or seventy-nine? 78, I yeah. would say, yeah. yeah. And there had been a, an axe fight there once, remember? Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I re that was a whopper. Uh, <laughs> I, that's when I think Jay started carrying his pistol. <laughs> so then we did the, the, uh, the new music series. And then the next year, um, we, inst we instituted a, uh, what we called a mainstream series. That was the Dexter Gordon poster and then Art Pepper. Look at that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, 
so Sun Ra, that was actually the last concert I produced when I was running the workshop. And then I went back east to do my own music for a while and to get a graduate degree. But that Sun Ra concert, it was in 1980, I guess. Uh, 81. 81. 81. And yeah. uh, we rented the sub ballroom at UNM, and there were 700 people there. Wow. I mean, that would not happen today. You know, it, <laughs> right. it, yeah. it, was a, it was a different time. There was a yeah. lot of excitement around the music. Yep. Woody Shaw, we presented. Yeah. And then it went, you know, went on from there. But anyway, that's the way I remember it is like, Steve, I think you were going off to New Guinea again, maybe, or whatever it was. Everybody was kind of going in different directions. They said, oh, you take it. And so I moved it. To, that's when I moved it down to Albuquerque. And mm -hmm. it really became, it lost a lot of that uh, spirit of being a co collective of musicians, how it started, and became more of a presenting organization, which... Mm -hmm. That yeah, was, that yeah, was that was kind of my, that was, uh, I won't say a thorn because it didn't hurt, mm -hmm. <laughs> but that was my opinion, you know, yeah. that we needed to, I was totally into community and education. Those are the two elements that, you know, I mean, that I, w what, what I wanted to come out of it as far as myself goes. As far as separating myself, I realized I wasn't going to be in mental health, <laughs> <laughs> so I better get a gig. <laughs> 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 and, and, and that's what drew me that way. What about you guys? Well, I think that um, even I started. Uh, I left New Mexico and started teaching. Uh, that's when you went to Philadelphia. I right? had a professorship at the University of Pennsylvania, starting in 1980, and. Um, but I would come back here and visit, and I remember the Sun Ra event, but I think what I most remember is on those visits how many of those concerts did contain a workshop component. I mean, when you brought Baird, even when you brought Baird here, you know, local musicians, it, it wasn't just Baird's band. It, yeah, it was you know, 12, he, 12 piece, yeah, 12 he, trumpets. Yeah, and Pete, you know, he, like he, you know, and, and David, I mean, we didn't just get to hear those people, you know, we got a chance to get to know them musically. And even the thing with, with the Sam Rivers and Dave Holland thing, I think was really exceptional, mainly because both of those guys, you know, already had quite a lot of experience doing teaching and doing we workshops always did and stuff clinics. like that. We always and did clinics, clinics. Yeah. yeah. And they were, they, were, they were great. They were really positive. And you just got the sense that here are these people who are, you know, so accomplished uh, but, you know, th they can deal with whatever level anybody is at in the room and, you know, like say, okay, here's this mode, uh, you know, and here's how it works and we're just going to improvise with it and, you know, here's what we're going to do with it and then we're going to change and we're going to go into this other mode or something like that. And they would just, you know, uh, do these things with these very simple open structures and it was very inclusive. It was very... Uh, you know, I, I felt that, you know, before we really had serious jazz education in the state, you know, in the universities and things like that, those, those workshops, I'm sure they really, really encouraged a lot of people who went on, you know, to have careers in music or, you know, people who, who are still, you know, involved in it. So, I, you know, it wasn't, you know, I, I thought it was great that you didn't, you know, that that transitional period of the workshop as a presenting organization, wasn't just you know booking concert artists, you know it was there was always that you know a clinic or. Well, it certainly was a change in my life, and I've been and it it's how I got in the business that uh, I'm still in today. So, yeah. you know, and uh, I'm I either blame you or I'm indebted to you, one <laughs> or the other, I'm, or both. <laughs> yeah. We really are a product yeah. of our time. And a lot of what we said, I'll, I'll just go through a couple of things. One was through the 60s. Uh, I, I, had, I was guaranteed 40 weeks a year playing music six, seven nights a week, never less than four. And that was my education. I didn't, I was, I'm uneducated. And, uh, and then uh, you, 
the transitional part with you, Tommy, is uh, when uh, when uh, you took over and we we each brought an artist over and I brought over Bobby Green. Bobby Green, yeah. So and Bobby, I'm I'm really only bringing this up because again it represents the period of time that uh, Steve brought out with Baker, and and uh, because that was like it was like the, the you know mid seventies, late seventies maybe somewhere in there. Yeah, late seventies. Yeah. Late seventies, yeah, around seventy. So, and I had experienced that with Bobby. I was Bobby was with Stanton Davis, and he had a I was, he was booked with me at an outdoor concert, and he said, I can't do it, Pete, because, you know, and Stan said, yeah. Stan Davis is the one that got him into uh, uh, New England Conservatory. So yeah. I understood, but that does dictate, or imply at least, that that was a changing time. It was the time that you, got, you described, my, uh, yeah. Steve, you know, where black musicians were getting into the educational system. I re remember Bobby Green and I standing on a street corner and I said, Bobby, I just got through, came through New York and I see the Metropole with go-go dancers. And Bobby looked at me and <coughs> says, Pete, he says, it's out of the clubs, man. It's all going into the schools. And that's what Bobby did. Bobby went back to school at 25 years old, became Professor of Afro-American Music Studies at New England Conservatory. Is he still alive? No, Bobby passed on. Yeah. He died very young. He died at 50 years old. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I think we should be uh, sort of uh, winding down, but maybe anybody it's have any questions? My bed, it's past my bedtime, Tom. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's definitely past Andy's bedtime. I'm glad I didn't have to tell any war stories, man. <laughs> 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 there will be a war stories session. There will be a war stories. I got on board. <laughs> but maybe some of you have a few questions. Anybody want to ask anything or say anything or yes? Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. I, I remember this that moment very well, and Pete, it, you know. I lived out there. This yeah. is Kent Patterson from KUNM, oh, who's okay. doing the history of yeah. the music and the yeah. history of all the oh, cool. music, of all the DJs and everything. So. That, you know, Pete was living in Cerritos and had lots of musical colleagues as well as friends in Madrid. and. Um, this was just a kind of magic moment in my mind when um, uh, Demetrius Aiello, uh, really, who was a you know carpenter and Madrid resident, said, "Let's fix up the ballpark, and and you know you guys can come and play every week." The ballpark was the first electric scoreboard west of the Mississippi. Isn't that right? right? Yep. Yeah. Oh. It was. Yep. Yes, it That's was. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, they, well, I, the locals uh, dug out the first three rows. It was yeah. buried. It was buried. It was buried. And I have pictures of that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you? Yeah. You know, I re I've got to say this. I remember one time we were playing out there, and I, I happened to be taking a chorus when a huge dust storm came, <laughs> and a whole bunch of <laughs> sand blew right up the bell of my horn. <laughs> <laughs> and you kept I playing. Had to get to work. <laughs> <laughs> I remember all the amplifiers getting drenched. Oh several yeah, times. yeah. That <laughs> we, we, we never stopped. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I I remember bringing a, a spinet my spinet piano up there in the back of the truck. Oh, at, geez. At the, in the first year I I was running it, you know, yeah. the Baldwin Acrosonic. <laughs> But but Pete, Pete, you really had deep relations in the community, and one of the pictures that I have here. No. <laughs> that that's a Baird Banner playing guitar. Is that correct? Uh, drums. Or no, play, playing, playing, drums. playing drums. Yeah, it's okay. Bill Roth yeah. playing guitar. 
Bill Roth. There's yep. Baird. Yeah, That's yeah Baird. there's Baird. Baird. And Baird was yeah. your neighbor at that point? Or yeah, he lived yeah. in Cerritos, moved to town, built uh, uh, that studio, Fluget uh, Sound. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and he's a very fine drummer. And that was the, the following year, because I had done 10 weeks. And the following year, I did some, and then I knocked on Bear's door, and I said, Bear, I got to do some gigs, man. <laughs> anyway, and I, but I yeah. think I think uh, it's it's kind of important to say this is not like a polished band that went up and played a song for five minutes. I mean, you know, if we were playing rhythm changes and there were ten people who wanted to blow, ten people blew, and you know, Dave, and, you know, you know. Dave and Pete would play rhythm changes for a half an hour. I mean, it was a very different experience for the rhythm section than for the rest of us who would get up and play our two, four, five choruses. But, you know, um, this, it really kind of incorporated this spirit of a jam. And, you know, there was no, um, nobody was curating it. So, you know, uh. some, some really amazing people came out of the woodwork and played and blew us away. And there were some people who, you know, probably shouldn't have stood up in front of a crowd with an instrument, but, you know, they did, and, you know, everybody was cool about it. I, I recall a Motown band playing, playing the, at the ballpark from Santa Fe, and Eddie, was, Eddie Harris was in town. I said, Eddie, come out to the ballpark and play. So I remember Tom Reem saying, well, wait a minute, man, we've got all these charts, man. He said, you know, he's got that horn section. And Eddie just stepped up, man, and just blew it all away. It was really an incredible moment, you know. Yeah. So it, as simple as I, as I could put it, it was the spirit of play. It really was the spirit of play. Jack, I look at you, Jack, and I remember how you were sparkling back then. I'm serious, man. I recall a tale of you telling me about an, a, an encounter with a snake. <laughs> you know what I'm yeah. talking about? There was, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, but I'll just end it there. It was the spirit of play. Everyone there, you know, just had a good time. And, and, uh, and it was all about the ability to have a, a place to play at. And, not worry about, you know, this or that or what. We were like the Grateful Dead of jazz, you know. We just yeah, jammed yeah. Yeah. on rhythm changes. <laughs> well, maybe, anyway. Yeah, maybe that's a good good place to stop. You yeah, know, maybe and, and it is. I, just, I think it is. Great, it great is. spirit, great, uh, great conversation. <laughs> Thank you so much for all you guys have done. Thanks for the jazz workshop continuing on all these years. Yeah. And, Thank uh, you. And really appreciate it. And thank, thanks to everybody who came out tonight. Thank you, Jack. Your house is still it's there. Raining. It's really raining. And wh oh. where are you? Right, what what right. town are you in, Jack? I'm south, about 15 miles south of Santa Fe. All right. Okay. Good. Good. Well, and thanks once again to Andres Martinez, who keeps this place going and. Uh, and we really appreci appreciate that. Yeah. And so thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Andy, for being such a well-behaved yeah. dog. <laughs>